It started at the Hustle Mart convenience store in Farmville, North Carolina. On a fateful night, the police received a 911 call that would lead them to one of the most gruesome crime scenes they had ever seen. Pitt County 911. Uh, yes, I need some help over here at the Hustle Mart. Uh, that, 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 the cook over here, been, it looks like he's been shot. Yeah, he's bleeding, he's, it's, it's blood all over the floor. Okay, is he is he completely alert? Is he responding at all? No, not, he's just moaning. That's, there's two of them. There's two of them, both of them been shot. Oh, there's two people. There's two. Officers rushed to the scene, guided by the chilling call. They arrived at the store to find bloody footprints leading to the exit. Just outside the cash register area, they discovered a young male victim, lifeless, with a bullet hole in the back of his head. Two more young men lay injured on the floor behind the front counter, also shot in the head, both in critical condition were immediately rushed to a hospital. Pitt County homicide detectives were called in, and they immediately started processing the crime scene. As detectives combed through the store they found three spent 9mm shell casings. They found scattered cash throughout the store, an open and empty cash register, and safe, suggesting a robbery gone wrong. Just outside the store officers saw more cash on the floor where they assumed the getaway car was parked. As detectives walked the scene, they noticed there were cameras throughout the store. The scene looked like a robbery gone bad, but as detectives watched the camera footage they realized this was something much more sinister. The security cameras inside the store captured every angle of the crime. Just before 10 p.m., three store workers were seen going about their business. Behind the counter closing out the register was the owner's son, 16-year-old Mokbel Mohammed Al-Mujani, also known as Sam. Sam was known as a quiet, reserved, nice kid by his classmates at Farmville Central High School, five minutes from the store. Sitting next to him was his uncle, 26-year-old Nabil Nasser, Saeed al Muganahi. Nabil who was known to be a joker, had just come to town that week from Queens, New York to give his older brother some time away from the store. In the back of the store mopping was 24-year-old Jabber Alawi who was store owner Mike's cousin and worked full-time at the store to support his wife and two kids. Suddenly, three armed suspects entered the store. Suspect 1 entered, pointing his gun at Sam and Nabil, who immediately complied and raised their hands. As Suspect 1 makes his way around the counter, Suspect 2 enters the store immediately followed by Suspect 3 both brandishing firearms. But what happens next is horrifying. As the three suspects hold them at gunpoint, Sam and Nabil immediately complied, putting the money down, dropping to their knees and putting their hands over their heads. Simultaneously, Suspect 3 realizes there is someone in the back of the store and walks over to Jaber making him drop to his knees and dragging him to the front of the store. Suspect 1 cleans out the register and asks where the rest of the money is. As he looks through the shelves, 16-year-old Sam keeps his head down, as Nabil points to the safe. Suspect 1 looks back at the safe, turns back, aims his gun, and shoots Sam in the back of the head completely unprovoked. Nabil is then ordered to open the safe. Suspect 1 empties the safe, grabs a pack of cigarettes, and without hesitating aims and shoots Jaber in the back of the head. He then turns back and executes Nabil the same way. On his way out, he bends down to pick up some cash he had dropped and exits the store. As detectives watched this unfold, they received a call informing them that Sam and Nabil had been pronounced dead at the hospital. Sam, the quiet teenager, Nabil, the Joker, and Jaber, a family man, all lost their lives that night. It was a senseless and heart-wrenching tragedy. What struck officers was how senseless and unprovoked these murders were. All three victims immediately complied with the robbers' demands and had handed over all the money and still they had been executed. The lead investigator, Detective Shannon Stewart, described the surveillance footage as the most horrific thing he had seen in his 30-year career. This footage convinced everyone that they were dealing with cold-blooded killers that needed to be taken off the streets, fast. We're talking about people with guns going into stores and just killing innocent people um, just for the self-gratification of getting money. News of the triple murder spread quickly through the small town of Farmville. The devastated family, well known in the community, received an outpouring of support. Vigils were held by the classmates of Sam, and a funeral took place for all the young victims April 3rd, two days after the tragedy. As a result of this senseless crime, 
nine children lost their fathers. Local residents were infuriated, knowing these three callous cold-blooded murderers were walking freely around their town. The loss of three loved ones shattered hearts and brought back painful memories for this family who had experienced a similar tragedy 20 years ago in Brooklyn, New York. In another convenience store run by their uncle Muhammad Al-Mujahami Mike and his brother, they were robbed and similar to the Hustle Mart. The robber fired shots, missing Muhammad but hitting and killing his brother. He had to leave the state to kind of forget about the story and he had chosen North Carolina thinking that he's going to have peace in here and, um, and get away from what had happened there. And um, so sad that same thing just happened again. Tony says his uncle had so much love for his brother, he named his only son 16-year-old Mock Bell or Sammy after him. Sammy was one of the three employees killed on April 1st. We're told that the sheriff will be returning the store over to the family soon, but because the painful memories are so strong, Tony says his family may not even keep it. We're currently thinking about selling the business and uh, maybe moving out of Farmville. Currently, the store remains the same way it looked the night of the shootings for a reason. Tony hopes these horrific images will be enough to convince a judge that the death penalty is needed in order for there to be justice. The police were determined to bring the killers to justice. They worked tirelessly, using every piece of evidence they had. They watched the video over and over, hoping to catch a clue they may have missed. It was clear to all from the video that Suspect 1 was calling the shots. At one point, the bandana covering his face slips a little, giving a glimpse of what he looked like, but it wasn't enough for an identification. He was wearing a blue plaid button-up shirt and a distinctive ball cap. It was a red, white, and blue Montreal Expos baseball cap. Suspect 2 was wearing black sweatpants and a black hoodie. When the first shot was fired, he is visibly shaken, looks to be frightened, and quickly leaves the store. The third suspect had on a black hoodie and red basketball shorts. He was the one that had dragged Jaber from the back of the store. Clips of the suspects were released asking the community to identify them and quickly thereafter tips started coming in. On the day of the funeral, police received a phone call from the owner of King's Mart, another convenience store located in the middle of town. The owner tells detectives that he recognizes the suspects and is sure they had been in his store just days before the robbery. Detectives quickly made their way to the King's Mart and watched the video footage from that day. Just after 6.30 p.m. on March 29th, a green Mazda pulls up to one of the gas pumps. A man exits the car and makes his way into the convenience store. As he enters the store, another man exits the car to pump gas. Another camera inside. The store captures a clearer image of the first man. He's a black male with a red, white, and blue hat the same hat suspect one wore at the Hustle Mart the night of the murders. A second camera inside the store gets a better image of the second man. He's a black male with dreads and does not fit the description of any of the suspects from the robbery. Police now had a face and a car and were getting closer to catching the suspects. Soon thereafter, police received another tip. A woman sounding scared tells police that she just saw a clip of the suspects and knew exactly who the man was in the plaid shirt. She said he was in her house at that very moment and begged for police to come and get him as soon as possible. Within a matter of minutes, a tactical team was dispatched and surrounded the residence the woman had called from. As soon as officers forced their way into the home, they spotted a man that quickly dropped his gun and told officers he was unarmed and did not want to be shot. He was cuffed and transported to the sheriff's office. The gun he had thrown down was a 9mm handgun and appeared to be the same one used in the murders. Police sent it in for ballistic testing to find out for certain. Captain Paula Dance with the Pitt County Sheriff's Office said, I remember as they brought him into the building, I've never in my entire life looked a person in the eye and saw nothing. Nothing, no soul, just a blank stare. The suspect was identified as 29-year-old Antoine Anthony. Antoine, who goes by his street name Smurf, was a felon and had just been released from prison two months prior. Detectives sit him down in an interview room to get his side of the story. Antoine is Detective Mitchell. I'm Detective Stewart. And, uh, we got some stuff we want to talk to you about, okay? Alright. Feel fine right there. I should say, you know your rights. They've been explained to you. Well, I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait. My heart is having a great present. 
You don't want to waive it? Is that what you said? No. Okay. Do you want to talk to him? I want to have an attorney, bro. Antoine refuses to talk to police, invoking his right to an attorney, but he is held in custody for felon in possession of a firearm. Word spread quickly in the small town of Farmville and people started to come forward to police. The first to come forward was to turn out to be Suspect 3, Xavier Shamble. So why is it, you know, why do you think you're here? Why do you think you're here? This is the level of Xavier identifies Antoine as suspect one and the shooter. He also identifies suspect two by name. As he realizes the seriousness of this case, he breaks down in tears and is later arrested and held in custody. A few hours later, just before 11 p.m., a woman brings in her 14-year-old son to the sheriff's office to talk about his involvement in the case. Her son was identified as Raekwon Blunt, suspect number two who had panicked at the first shot. The first shot, you ran out of here. Scared the hell out of you, didn't you? I can see it. If your son is scared, why did you come back? Why? You could have gotten a car, you could have run down the road, you didn't want to leave tells of a fourth suspect, the getaway driver. His description of the car matched the green Mazda captured on video at the King's Mart. He knows the driver only by his nickname, Wicked, and described him as having dreadlocks just like the man seen at King's Mart. With a photo lineup, detectives were able to come up with Wicked's real name, Willie Whitehead, a known gang member in the local area. Willie was quickly located and brought in, However, he denies any involvement in the robbery. Did you know what happened the night while we're here? What we're talking about? Yeah, of course I know what happened. You've been on the news. Whitehead gives detectives his girlfriend's name as an alibi witness. That evening, his girlfriend, without being prompted, showed up at the station telling detectives that Willie had been with her the night of the murders. Detectives were not buying it. Based on information from 14-year-old Raekwon officers located the house that the suspects all went to after the robbery and arrived with a search warrant, in the driveway police found the green Mazda that was seen at the King's Mart and a second car, a green Chrysler. Both cars were seized and thoroughly searched. Police found a Walmart receipt for 9mm ammo that was purchased just two days before the murders. Using the timestamps on the receipt, police were able to see who made the purchase. It was a woman with two men standing right behind her. After the purchase was made, the men exited the store together, followed by the woman. The two men were none other than Willie Whitehead and Antoine Anthony. All the pieces were falling into place a week after the suspects were all brought into custody. The last piece of the puzzle would come walking right into the sheriff's office. The girlfriend of Willie Whitehead who provided him with an alibi came forward to detectives. Can I, I want to say something. Yes, ma'am. If I tell you the truth, tell you 100%. Ensure my safety. I'm not talking about Willie. I'm talking about the Antoine. He said Willie was here, right? And I just looked at him. He said, if go down, you better tell them people Willie was here. He said, if you don't, I'm gonna kill you. Or I'm getting some of my scratch to kill you. Okay. She tells the detectives that Antoine threatened her into providing her boyfriend with an alibi and that her boyfriend was actually not with her that night. She was ultimately charged with three counts of accessory after the fact. The final piece of the puzzle came when the ballistic report on Antoine's gun came in, and it was determined that the gun was the same one that fired all three rounds in the Hustle Mart. All four suspects were charged with multiple counts of robbery and murder prosecutors, now had a strong case, and were pushing for the death penalty. 
Xavier Shamble and Raekwon Blunt both pleaded guilty to armed robbery and three counts of second-degree murder. Shamble was sentenced to 13 to 17 years, and Blunt was sentenced to 9-12. Willie Whitehead fought his case and lost. He was found guilty of three counts of first-degree murder and was handed three life sentences. Antoine Anthony also fought his case and was found guilty of three counts of first-degree murder and robbery with a dangerous weapon. He was sentenced to death and is currently on death row going through his appeals.